Hey everyone, we're Jordan and Antoinette, and welcome to the second episode of the Happen Films podcast, which we're recording during the COVID-19 pandemic when we can't go out and shoot new films. This week we're chatting to Rob Greenfield. You might have heard of him as Dude Making a Difference, and you might have come across publicity of one of his awesome projects, everything from wearing his own trash for a whole month to growing and foraging 100% of his food for a whole year. He's an activist, an adventurer, a humanitarian who takes things to the extreme in the most positive ways. He's been a huge inspiration for us over the last few years, so we're stoked to be able to chat with him today and share that conversation with you. Cool. Okay. Hey, Rob. Nice to see you across the ether. (laughs) Yes. Very nice to see you too. Yeah. Wish it was in person. Hopefully it will be one day. Really looking forward to yeah, making a film I mean, with you one day. I am too. How long has it been now? It's been four years since we've been in contact? Yep. Something like that. Yeah, yep. we've been following your work for ages, it seems like. Yeah. I was looking back at some of your old videos and it's like, wow, that was 2016 when you were doing that. And I think that's around the time that we came across what you're doing. Yeah. And it's a year yeah. It's a year now that we've been talking about making a film. So, um, And that's a bit on hold now, isn't it? But we're going to do it. <laughs> and in the meantime, yes. we've, we've got, yeah, we've got the podcast option. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, we're not in person, but I feel you. I, f- you know, I feel the warmth and the comfort, the good vibes coming across the, across the oceans and the lands from New Zealand all the way over here to France. Yeah. So yeah. you're in France. So, okay. So let's start, like, tell us about where you are and, and tell us how you're feeling. With, cause just to provide a bit of context, uh, we're experiencing the, well, the globally we're experiencing the effects of the coronavirus at the moment. Um, and Rob, you're not from France normally, you're an American. So <laughs> how did you end up there and how are you kind of dealing with everything that's going on with um, COVID-19? Yeah, I definitely feel like there's a little confusion when people talk to me. They're like, what are you, wait, what are you doing in France? Do you live there now? Or you know, what are you doing over there? And basically, th- th- this year, 2020, the idea was I was on a world speaking tour. I left the United States in February and I had a, a one month or so stop in Costa Rica. That was my first spot. I gave a handful of talks there and then I landed in Berlin, Germany just a few days before things started to really just massively shift. And when I was in Berlin, my event there was canceled and it looked like maybe a few more events would cancel. And then within a few days, all of a sudden my entire year plan is just, you know, disappearing. And I was in Amsterdam when things started to really accelerate and my thing was I wasn't going to get stuck in um, a city. So I hopped on the train before um, the whole lockdown happened. I arrived in South France about two hours before the president made an announcement that France was basically locking down. (laughs) And now where I am, if I want to leave the house, I have to fill out this paper and write the time and... um, I can only leave the house for an hour at a time for a specific purpose, and I can only go a kilometer from the house even. So I'm definitely in a sort of lockdown over here. Yeah. Yeah, that's next level lockdown because New Zealand's in lockdown as well, but there's uh, less restrictions yeah. around it, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, no, it's not. No forms to fill in. No. <laughs> Yeah, I'm 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 grateful to be isolated, you know, in the sense that I chose to be in the countryside. Like I said, I wasn't going to be stuck in the city. But I'm also I'm right between Italy and Spain and France is part of the epicenter right now. So, although I'm isolated here in the countryside and I'm so grateful I'm able to go for a at, you know, an hour walk in the woods every day and I'm out foraging dandelions and onions that are coming up in the spring. Um, so I'm isolated, but also at the same time, it's it's pretty crazy time to to be here and um, be in a place that totally unfamiliar. Here I am, just a uh, human being out here, and uh, just here I am. And your 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 family's back in the states, obviously, and you're 
yeah, you're probably on your own quite a bit. Like, how's that all feeling? Well, I, you know, we've talked before and I personally have been practicing impermanent, you know, I've designed my life to be impermanent for quite a while now. And so for me, as long as I'm balanced inside, it doesn't really matter where I am. Um, I can be at home. You know, they say like home is where your heart is. And that's usually associated with loving someone, a partner that you love so much. And I've experienced that. But my heart is in here and my feelings are in here. So at this point, I don't have a partner to feel at home with, but I do feel at home within myself because I have, you know, really worked on that. So, um, so overall, I mean, I feel, I personally am happy to say that I, I feel, you know, very balanced and good and I'm able to be of service still, you know, using the computer and the digital world, even though I'm in isolation, I'm still able to be of service. And that's what definitely what keeps me going is being able to be meaningful, have a purpose and have passion. And I'm still able to do that. In, in what ways are you doing that? Because it's it's quite different because you're you're so much, you know, about community and, you know, human interaction and to for that to be kind of a risky thing now is um, yeah. pretty interesting. It's it's very interesting. I mean, I am a hugger. I I always say it's something like eight hugs a day keeps the doctor away. And I mean, I strive to have dozens of hugs a day from different, ideally from dozens of different people. Um, that's a big center of my life is, you know, em- embracing people for the sake, from, you know, my own benefit for, for, for theirs as well. Just that, that connection. Um, and so for me, yeah, I mean, I haven't had a, I haven't had a single hug in 17 days, I think is the last time that I had a hug a long time so i'm definitely feeling some of the isolation um but again it's not too bad um and so how i'm being of service one way is that i used social media to put out a call where basically i said if you're in isolation and you're having a hard time physically or mentally then i'll do a a a, a face to face to face conversation and so i've had about 50 facetime conversations with people from around the world that have been feeling isolated. And so that was just something that came to me. I was like, okay, here's how I can be of service. I can't hug anyone. I can't build gardens for people right now, but this is how in the moment that I'm in, I can be of service to people in a meaningful way. Yeah, so tell me like what kind of um, conversations are you having? How are you finding people? How are they feeling? Is there a a diversity of um, emotions? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's an interesting time. There's no question about it. And, you know, I like to always make sure to not get too caught up in the moment and to remember to look at the bigger picture. I mean, that's how I've designed my whole life is to remember to always look at the bigger picture. And so it's very easy to really get caught in just this moment of chaos and panic. But you can also zoom out and you can see, Humanity has gone through things, you know, very similar to this for for as long as humanity has lived, we have gone through catastrophes and look, here we are, we're still here. And so by, you know, zooming out, it really helps to make things a lot more comfortable and be able to manage to get through this. And the people that I've been talking to, a whole range, I mean, some people are in a very difficult place and just feeling depressed and isolated and other people are taking this opportunity to expand their you know their minds and focus on things they've been wanting to focus on you know get into projects they've been wanting to uh, get into reading books they've been wanting to or just you know really get into you know self-reflection and how they can get out of this in a better place and launch themselves forward to live the life they want so it's been it's actually been a beautiful experience to talk to people all over the world and uh, talk to people in the United States, all across France, Iran, um, over down under, um, and so yeah, it's been a, it's been really interesting to see people's perspective and and share with that. That's such a cool thing to be able to do, mm. and it's I think this this kind of window of um, what's normal being interrupted will be 
quite interesting for people to kind of reflect on their lives and um, maybe, yeah, learn something new or think about how they can kind of incorporate the good things about this period going forward when things do kind of return to somewhat uh, of a normal state. And there might be, yeah, quite a few kind of personal journeys that come out of this. And I'm interested to hear about your personal journey because you haven't always been an environmentalist, um, radical sustainability um, uh, kind of change maker, have you? No, um, it's been about a decade now since I really shifted my life, and it's it's kind of weird. I mean, I've been I've been doing this for long enough now to say it's been a decade since I awoke and. That's a bit of time compared to five years it was. And anyway, yeah, so 2011 is when I is when I really uh, started to educate myself. I started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books. And well, I guess to go backwards a little bit. Yes, at that time, I was living a very materialistic life. I was very focused on financial wealth. I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. And I was very you know, ego-based, um, just acting based on what other people would think about me and, and achieving success and basically living the American dream. And then I started to watch a lot of documentaries, read books and listen to other perspectives. And I just woke up to the fact that my life was not what I thought it was at all, that my life was really in contradiction. My actions and my beliefs were in total contradiction. I was a complete hypocrite. And that I was buying into all these lies that corporations had sold me on what I needed to do in order to be a happy, healthy, successful human being. And I pretty quickly decided that I was going to radically transform my life and, you know, just just change it drastically. Were there any kind of key experiences that um, that kind of pushed you along on that journey? You know, I I don't recall really key experiences. For me, it was just day after day, week after week of just continuously expanding my horizons and just seeing, oh, okay, this is possible. And oh, okay, that's possible. And I quickly, for me, what happened was as soon as I learned that I was a part of all of the problems in the world that I didn't stand for, Basically, I started to change my life little by little. And and so I started to transform myself by one action at a time. And what happened was I I started to, you know, pretty quickly change my life and it was little little things at a time, but what happened was I kept seeing changes within myself. I would see, okay, I'm I'm just feeling much happier than before. I'm I'm continuously felt myself getting healthier. I sensed, you know, just more contentedness and also physically I started to see myself to be able to just do things I wasn't able to do before. And so it was just this constant little positive feedback cycle and these just constant little awakenings day by day that just kept me going down this path, seeking more and removing myself further and further from the systems that I didn't support and moving more and more into the systems that felt right for myself and for being able to have a a clear conscious that I was living in a way that wasn't destroying the world, but that was actually ideally improving the quality of life of people around me. And I think that can be quite challenging for most people, especially if you're kind of going against what's normal in your maybe family, friend circle, social group. Did you find that challenging? Like there's a, there's probably an aspect of like, what will people think of me if I suddenly start living differently? And there's, there's that's a big barrier, I think. Yeah. So, and that's something I feel from people all the time. I mean, now 10 years later, I have so many people asking me questions that are they're wanting to get out of the rat race and like get away from the social stigmas and social norms that hold them back and that honestly is one of the biggest things like how did you just get past the worries of what people would think your family your friends the the societal constructs and 
The answer is not necessarily clear. It's a mixture of everything, as most things are. But two things. One is there was part of me that was always a little bit different. Um, I grew up in a small town in northern Wisconsin, and I was, I was just... There was always a part of me that didn't belong there. I always felt like it was my destiny to, you know, really get out of that place and see the world. And so that always, you know, made me feel a little different. I wasn't trying to stay there like a lot of the people, a lot of my, a lot of people were. Um, and so there was a part of me that, you know, that often thought about things a little bit differently. But there was also that same part of me that was just trying to fit into the American dream. So. When I did decide that I was going to radically transform my life, I had that bit of a head start for me, for me that I wasn't so locked down to a place or a particular people, um, whereas a lot of people have like this physical, deep like need for either a location or particular family or friends, and I didn't have that. I sort of had already set myself free of that element. Um, and then I always have been somewhat outgoing and 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 uh, basically a bit of a free spirit, so that helped. But at the same time, I had to constantly be. There were so many things that I had to constantly break free from as well. I mean, just so many of the social constructs that your car is not just your form of transportation; it's also your image, who you are. Um, and so breaking free from those sorts of things, or when I began dumpster diving, at first I didn't tell people I was dumpster diving because I would worry, I worried what they would think about me. Um, and so, yeah, I had to break free from those things. And one of the big things is just that realize, you know, one of the big things is realize, was realizing that the state of being human is a state of delusion, in my opinion. And, you know, the more I look into things, the more that I realize that I think that we're largely living in a state of delusion. And if that's the case, then why does it matter what people thinking about think about me at all if it's one big, you know, state of delusion? And that really let off a lot of the pressure. Could you um, elaborate on the state of delusion? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess especially for people who are not aware of any delusion, then that would be like, well, what, what the heck are you talking about? Yeah. So, I mean, there's the, there's like the, the, ob well, there's, there's, there's the bigger piece that we will all mostly always operate under that. And that is, you know, just the reality that we are on this little sphere, this ball, and that we're flying, what, thousands of miles per hour through the sky and spinning at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. Yet we think we're still, I feel like I'm still right now. So we're able to completely, um, you know, forget about these things. Or, you know, if you if you look at quantum physics, supposedly my hands are not touching right now, according to quantum physics. But I truly feel that I am. Or when I hug you, I'm pretty sure we're touching. But according to quantum phys physics, we're not. So when you look at those things, you realize that our minds are operating under a state of delusion. Those are not the delusions that I'm trying to overcome. The delusions that I'm working on overcoming are the ones that are possible. So, you know, like 2009, the, the housing market crash, when a million people who thought they were financially secure and had their life set lost their house overnight because of corruption, that's waking up to the delusion. Or when you realize that your money in the banks is invested in projects that are destroying the world and you're a part of that, that's waking up to the delusion. So for me, it's about embracing that I'll always be in a state of delusion as a human, but overcoming the states of delusion that we actually can and have the power to overcome. And having made, <clears throat> having kind of um, take, uh, taken that those thought processes through to, to um the place where you are now, which I think has, includes you don't have a, a credit card and, and social security. Is that right? Yeah. So this is my backpack right here. And this backpack is everything that I own. So I have 44 items and I have less than $5,000 cash. I think maybe $4,000 now. No bank account, no credit card, no debit card. No driver's license or car, no cell phone, 
um, no debt, um, no savings whatsoever, no retirement or IRAs or anything like that. Literally, I'm here in southern France and everything that I own is here with me in this room that I'm staying in right now. And that's what I'm talking about when I say I'm I'm trying to be embrace my impermanence, that I'm here for a very short period of time and I'm trying to design my life around the fact that I am here for this tiny period of time. And that is, for me, extremely powerful um, to do that and to practice that that embracement of, of my, yeah, my impermanence. And that allows me to be super, so much more present because here I am. It's just, here I am. Mm. It's really interesting because, um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's one thing I'd love to come back to on that um, point because I think that that freedom that you've created for yourself is also, also creates a lot of resilience for you. And that there's a, an element to resilience around um, providing our food and so on that, that I'd like to come back to but but I'm also really it's also really interesting hearing you talk about that in relation to what's going on in the world at the moment because this lockdown that's happening around the world is obviously going to create a massive recession um I I think from the reading we've done it's it's going to be bigger than than a lot of people are talking about at the moment you in the position you're in with with what a lot of people would say would call you know almost nothing you're you're actually probably really resilient in the face of that are you feeling quite um relaxed with that uh potential future ahead of us yeah absolutely because you know that's the thing and you know going back to delusion is that people think that security is having a lot of money in a bank account and having you know your your iras your your savings and i just don't believe that that is security i believe that security is the relationships that you create with people, with other species, and with our environment, and our skill sets. It doesn't, if you, it doesn't matter how the economy is doing, if you're able to meet your basic needs as a human, and those basic needs, both including things like food and water and shelter, but also having a purpose, having passion, having reason to be alive. And so, I mean, I designed my life around resilience, and another big, I think more, worth more than money, is the skill of problem solving. If you can solve problems, you don't need so much money. Today, what's happened is people have outsourced problem solving for money. They have a job where they know how to do that problem and they get money for it. And in doing so, they no longer have to remember how to solve any other problems because now what they do is to just hand over money or swipe a credit card and that solves their problems. So the alternative for me is skip the money, be, you could say, a jack of all trades, someone who knows how to, you don't have to know what to do, but if you have problem solving and critical thinking skills, then you're able to look at each situation and figure out a way generally. So yeah, for me, resilience is skill sets, it's community and community including people working with the other species we share this earth with and with the the environment that obviously the trees the water the soil sure humans have monetized that but all of that exists before money and if you know how to work with it you can step away from that financial system and that's resilience yeah it seems like the you the less you can be tied to the more traditional systems of security, the more resilient you are. I do believe that. And then at the same time, I'm not going to act under a state of delusion that if the world goes into utter chaos, that you're necessarily able to take care of yourself when 7 billion people no longer have their needs met and they have to fan out from the cities to figure out how to feed their families, feed themselves and meet their absolute basic needs. So although... I'm a practitioner of permaculture. I've never used that word. That sounds weird. A person who practices permaculture and resilience and sustainable living. I also, I, I'm also at the mercy of the state of humanity at the same time. And if, if everything does go extremely poorly, then it doesn't necessarily matter how good my skills are if things go really crashing down. So that's also where I have to let go of control. I can't 
control the situation. I can do my best, but I just, that comes back to impermanence. I am not completely set on whether I am living or not living because I can zoom out and I can look at the fact that 99.9% of all humans that ever have lived have already died. Uh, 99.9% of all species that have ever lived have already died. That I'm just one in 7 billion, that our species is just one in somewhere between 7 and 20 million species currently alive. And so when you look at that bigger picture, you just realize that, okay, whatever happens, one of these t- one of these days I'm going to die, and that is okay. And I want to acknowledge that I'm saying that as a young, healthy person, so it's much easier to say that. But I also want to acknowledge that in a lot of cultures, they accept death, not you know, a lot of the Western cultures, death is the, the, it's something to fear. But for a lot of humanity, death wasn't something to fear. It is just what it is. And that's also another form of resilience. Accepting your impermanence, to, for me, is probably my greatest form of resilience. Believing that it's okay whether I'm alive in this form or not. I mean, for me, that's kind of the ultimate form of resilience if I can truly come um, in place with that. Do you think the the more connected to nature you are, the the less you fear death. Because that's what I found in myself is that being on this journey, I've, in, in a similar way, I don't want to die. I love being alive. But if I did happen to die, it's okay because that's how, the, how it works. Yeah, it's, it is how it works. It's just accepting reality. Um, and yeah, I think probably being closer to nature is part of it. For me, the biggest part of it has been through simplifying my life. I mean, if just think about it. If you have a big mansion and you have three cars in the driveway and you have a bank account with a million dollars and you have all these people that are depending upon you, uh, a business and then maybe a large family, wife, or husband and children um, to die well there's a lot that needs to be taken care of but for me because I literally I have almost nothing about as close to nothing as it gets for you know someone living in a western society in 2020 that has been like for me the biggest and this was never what I expected. You know, people talk about minimalism and things like that. I never thought by downsizing my life so drastically that I would become more accepting of my impermanence. But that's really one of the, for me, the biggest connections of where that comes from. It's just that I have created a state of impermanence and that has allowed me to accept it. Um, so that's really the the bigger part of it. But also definitely being part of nature. I mean, it's it's much easier to feel okay with passing when you are surrounded by beauty and know you can re-enter the soil rather than the idea of being hit by a taxi in downtown Manhattan. That's, you know, not the most comforting place to think about going out. <laughs> I, saw, I know. I love in, I saw one of your videos where in it you said, you were talking about your clothing and you said you wanted to wear all natural fibers so that if you just happen to die in the forest or fell into the ocean and died that you wouldn't litter (laughs) (laughs) it's 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 truly how i'm designing my life i mean (laughs) i think it's i i don't know i have a fascination with i have a deep deep fascination with with well with impermanence i'm going to say but i also have a deep fascination with just existence what is it what you know what is this i mean for me i'm fascinated by this very concept that if a bullet enters a portion of this brain, not even the whole thing, it's just a tiny portion of my body, then all of a sudden I'm gone. I'm just, I'm dead. And what happens to this, to what we might call the spirit? How is it that just that one bullet is just all of a sudden it's gone? So I'm fascinated about this. It's one of the things that intrigues me the most. And what that means is I spend a lot of time thinking about it. I spend a lot of time thinking about death. I mean, I think not a day goes by where I don't think about it. And honestly, I don't think about it negatively. I'm There's part of me that's excited about the concept of, I'm just very excited about doing things 
in a deeply meaningful and right way. And I think death is one of the most deep, deeply meaningful things. And so to me, it's very important that I design my life so that when I go, I don't believe I don't leave behind a mess. And re-entering the earth, if I happen to, you know, die in the woods or fall into the ocean and have everything on me be biodegradable and be able to be, you know, reintegrated into the earth, that for me is just it probably what it is it's it's more of like the the philosophy that really is the symbol of a life well lived that is in alignment with with the earth and and working with it rather than against it i had a great idea you could always keep some seeds in your pocket so if you did happen to die in the forest you would just decompose and then some pumpkins would grow <laughs> Ooh, pumpkins. I'm a big fan of, uh, I'm a big fan of pumpkin. Now, if I'm going to do that, what I have to do is I have to go die in a tree so the pumpkins can then like come down and I can have hanging pumpkins because that's my ultimate dream. I have never grown uh, hanging pumpkins and that's like my goal in life is one day to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a really it's a really beautiful philosophy it's a beautiful way to live from from my perspective um I, it's it's what i guess a lot of people would call extreme an extremist um way of approaching life and death um and i'm really i guess sort of going back to to just the the bigger picture of how you're living your life um i'm anticipating the comments that we'll get on on YouTube videos because I'm always anticipating them to some extent um, and there's inevitably there's going to be somebody who says um, well that's all very nice for him but we couldn't all live like that which is obviously the case um, but I'm interested in your perspective on that like what this is the way that you're, you've chosen to live for yourself and I know it's not the way that you su uh, are suggesting everybody should live but what's your sort of um, perspective on on the way on on sort of how the world runs and this is your place in it but what's yeah how do you how do you feel that um this fits in the way that the world runs absolutely i mean there's no question i'll be the first person to say that i'm extreme and i'll be the first person to say that my life is not designed to be followed exactly the purpose of my life is that i stand as a counterbalance to the extreme reality that we live in. So the United States where I'm from has 5% of the world's population but uses 25% of the world's resources. That by definition is extreme. And so the purpose of my life is to stand against that extreme, to wake people up. Because if all I did was go and live a life of moderation, that wouldn't create the extreme thoughts that I'm trying to create. What I'm trying to do is get people to look at my life and really self-reflect. I'm trying to get them to look at my life and be, by me taking it to such a far extreme, get them to start questioning their own lives. So the idea is not for anyone to live exactly like me by any means, but within my life, the idea is that there's a lot of lessons of things that people can do to shift towards a way of living that is less destructive and that is you know, more harmonious with the earth. And at the same time, what I do is point people to alternatives. So I often will take on, you know, an extreme project, but then what I always come back to is, here's what you can do. So the idea is always to get people to think, to rethink society, question it, and then, you know, and then embrace the alternatives and go for those alternatives. So, you know, you know, my you heroes are people who do things in a way that it's not designed for everybody else to do. You know, I I look to people like Gandhi, for example. He's one of my uh, I guess role models would maybe be the word that I would use. Someone that I look to. And the idea was never to be him. It was that he was trying to create great change through doing sort of extreme things. And so that's the idea. Um, and as far as, you know, I guess for people, it's really about getting people to start where they are. Maybe you have a family of five. So obviously you're going to do things differently. Maybe you live in a cold climate and not a warm climate. Um, so it's, and there, 
you know, you're not going to live in a tiny house with no insulation. There you might do a straw bale house or um, an earth ship. So it's always about plugging people into the alternatives and the other, you know, exploring those alternatives and showing what's possible. Yeah, I think you do a great job at that. I'm always amazed at how much media attention that you get. Mm. And you you did that with your latest, uh, I guess, big project, would you say, is um, foraging and growing 100% of your food for a year. Um, what Using that project as an example of that kind of extreme, how what, what would you hope people take away from you doing that experiment? Yeah, that is a perfect example. I mean, I grew and foraged 100% of my food for a year, literally, you know, no, no exceptions, nothing from grocery stores or restaurants, nothing packaged or processed, nothing shipped long distances, literally everything I ate, I either had to harvest from my gardens or go out into nature. I'm using nature because nature is a incorrect term the whole world is nature and we are nature but going out into the woods the lakes and such and so i went for a hundred percent to see if it was possible and to do an extreme thing that would get mainstream media to create a conversation about food about our global industrial food system the problems with it and the solutions so my goal through that is to get people to connect with their food first of all where does it come from how does it get to them What is the impact that it has on people, other species, and the environment as a whole? So first, questioning what they're currently eating. And if they don't like the answers to what they find, then going into the alternatives. So for that, we don't even as individuals necessarily need to grow any of of our food. That could be connecting with local farmers and growers and supporting local growers and getting our food locally. Going to the local farmer's market, for example, or local food co-ops. But there's a deep connection with growing our own food, even if it's just a little bit. So for me, it was about getting people to plant their food for the first time. Maybe it's turning their whole front yard into a garden. Maybe it's just a small raised bed. Maybe it's some tomatoes and, you know, greens and herbs on their balcony or even just some herbs on their windowsill uh, or joining a community garden or subscribing to a CSA and then foraging. You know, learning the foods that are growing freely and abundantly all around them. And that doesn't mean going into the great unknown. It could mean harvesting dandelions or lamb's quarter or purslane or amaranth that's growing up through the cracks in the city or in the abandoned lots or right in people's front and backyards. And so that's what it's about. It was about doing it in an extreme way that would really get people who have never thought about it before, because that's the purpose. My goal isn't just to reach environmentalists. My goal is to do things in a way that anybody can be interested. I mean, anybody today in our modern society can be like, what do you mean a year without grocery stores? And get the conversation going in with people that you know haven't really thought about that before. And that's exactly what it did. Just got people thinking and then got people acting. And I'm really happy to say that through that project, I think it's safe to say, you know, thousands more people are growing a little bit of their own food. And one other thing is that for people who are already doing a lot, like like you two, for example, are already growing food and foraging food and living in community and living tiny and such, by me taking it to such an extreme, my goal is to get people that have already taken a hundred steps or a thousand steps to take the hundred and first or the thousandth and first step and get people continuing to go further and just be in that positive inspiration and influence for people who are already change makers um, and uh, you know just keeping them down that path and being that inspiration to have them to, to help them. Mm. And it is, it's super inspiring mm. and we're, we're definitely grateful for everything you do. Um, and, I, but I'm re- and I'm really interested to know whether, because, y- you know, you're living in such an extreme way and, um, and having that sort of um, commitment to, to inspiring the, the rest of us, but, but also being very aware of all the bad news, I guess, of what's going on in the world. How do you create that balance? Um, because you're very positive. You're always in, in all of your videos. Well, which is not to say that you never um, acknowledge your downtimes, which I think is awesome. Mm. But you do ultimately stay very positive. <laughs> um, what, yeah, what's the? How have you achieved that? I think part of it comes down to 
to rational and logical thinking. I do what I need to do to get it done. And I just know that being down and being angry isn't going to accomplish the task at hand. And the, comp- the task at hand is to change minds, to change society and improve quality of life of people around me. And sure, anger is important sometimes. Anger can, you know, fuel that momentum as needed. So I do feel anger at corruption and greed. I mean, inequality and injustice is what just, just, oh, just angers. You know, I felt it. I'm reading a book uh, called Fast Food Nation right now, and it's really about the injustice of the, you know, the fast food industry and everything that it's done. And I've gone to bed angry a lot of the last nights because of that. Um, But it's about acknowledging that anger, dealing with that anger, and then turning it into something, you know, using it in a way to affect positive change. I've seen anger can be used well, but generally, if peop- if you're trying to change people, you have to meet them where they are. And people, they have enough negativity and anger and depression in their life, and they want something to lift them up. And they want, uh, they, they want, to be inspired. And so part of my job is to do that and to overcome the the anger and the and the depression and things like that that I you know I do still experience and um and just do what I can. And that's the other big part of it is that in no way shape or form do I believe that the world's problems are on my back. I'm one human being amongst 7 billion. I was born here with no responsibility to change the world. I don't believe that any of us, just because we're born in this place and time that has a lot of problems, that is our responsibility to change them. So I don't have the burden of the world on my back. I'm doing it because it's what I feel is right and it's because I want to be doing it, not because it's coming from a place where I have to be doing it. So, I mean, that's the other big part about it is this is my passion and it's my purpose and it's just, it simply is what I want to be doing. If this wasn't what I'd want to be doing, then I could feel, you know, lost and depressed. But it's like if you go to a nine to five job and the job doesn't serve you, it's not going to make you feel good inside and it's going to burn you out. But for me, it's, you know, it's the opposite. I'm not being selfless or altruistic here. This is me doing my best to live a life that I can be proud of and where I can know that I improved quality of life of people and other species around me and didn't decrease it. So it's partly that I'm on a mission, my own personal mission to, again, live a good life and have a positive impact. And that drives me. And then as equally as much important to that is the reality of the situation of that there is the injustice and there is the inequality and and fighting against that. So it's a combination of those of those things. So for people who are maybe feeling quite despairing about the state of the world, especially at the moment, um, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. How do you think those people can start to take a step towards i guess living in a in a way that they that feels impactful and like you're making a difference because it can be so easy to feel like the choices you make in your life don't have an effect on the world when you know there's seven billion other people there's so many problems what's what's my life um, going to do what would you say to people who are I guess in in that space of I guess being stuck yeah I feel for them Um, I've definitely felt stuck plenty of times in my life and even more so I just I I spend time with people that are stuck so much Um, and I I hear from people that are stuck so much I think stuck is largely the state of our of humanity um the thing is that you know millions of people have woken up to the problems that exist in the world but far 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 fewer have actually acted upon it we are in a great awakening 
but not as much in a state of great action. And that is because people feel stuck on where to start. And it's totally understandable because where do you start when you realize everything you learned was a lie? Everything you learned was not true. Where do you where do you start when you realize your society wasn't what you thought it was and that your life isn't what you thought it was? And maybe even that your family, who you love so dearly, is you know, not waking up to a lot of these things that we're waking up to, you know? How do you start? So I completely understand that. And for me, what I would say is you have to embrace who you are. You can only be you. Where you are, you can only be where you are in that moment and the time that you're in. That's that you have to embrace that reality and then you have to start there. You can't look at someone who is 10 years ahead of you that already started their mission and just think you want to be there. No, because they started somewhere too. You have to start somewhere. And my suggestion is one, to start small. Don't underestimate the the difference of making a change and not because that one change necessarily makes a big enough difference in the world, but because it is the change in yourself. And what's truly powerful that I've seen is that when someone starts to make changes and they do it for a while, months, maybe, you know, a couple of years, what happens is, sure, you know, not using plastic straws really the change of that is is minimal. But when you ch- make 50 changes like that, what you do is you create an empowered human being. And we don't need people who can yell at corporations and tell them what they're doing is wrong if they're supporting that corporation and they're coming from a place of hypocrisy. When you can stand up to a corporation and, or a government and say, I don't need you and I actually can do this without you and I have actually transitioned away from you, that is a place of power. And once you start to feel that power, that's what really can allow you to start more even deeply transforming. So I really suggest starting with small things that can slowly transform you. Setting goals. What I did is I made a goal of making one positive change per week. And after two years, I had made a hundred positive changes. That is a transformation. And it didn't happen over ever overnight. It took a couple of years. And the other suggestion would be to start with what you're excited about, not with the things that you have, you know, that you're just like, feel like you have to do, like it's a chore, but instead start with the things that you're really passionate and excited about. Maybe you're really excited about, you know, local food, starting to buy food at the local farmer's market. And maybe you're really excited about nutrition, eating healthier uh, and being healthier. That is a great place to start. Um, Maybe you're really interested in growing food. Great place to start. Maybe you're really interested in just volunteering, um, you know, helping other people in need. Another great place to start. Maybe you're interested in learning how to make things, whether it be, you know, knitting or sewing or leather work or uh, metal work or woodwork. Um, So there's hundreds of different things that you can start with. And my suggestion is start with what you're excited about and passionate about and then let that, you know, let those little parts of the web just start to weave in into other areas of your life and just start to pull you away from mainstream, normal way of living and just pull you into it one little bit at a time. One other tip I want to mention is that change your surroundings. I I do believe the idea that you are your surroundings. Now, you can break free within your own surroundings, but it's so much easier when you are surrounded by the things that you want to be. So, as much as possible, try to surround yourself by what it is you want to be. And that could mean leaving it behind and living somewhere else, or it could mean just finding it within your community, maybe joining a local permaculture group or joining a local um, uh, community garden, volunteering, uh, maybe, uh, you know, going to the local co-op and looking at the the board where people post... um, you know, little the activities and happenings in the in the community and, and going and getting involved in those things. So 
get involved and surround yourself with the people that you want to be and the things that you want to be. And that can really shift things because then you're getting away from going against the grain and you could be going with the grain of those people in that place. Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful approach Mm -hmm. to the whole thing. And that the fact that it is a journey, you can't do everything at once. And it's, um, it's probably similar to kind of like successful musicians say, um, there's a quote that's something like every overnight success is 10 years in the making. You know, you don't see all the work and all the little steps that go into someone who's just kind of amazing at something. There's all these, there's all these steps you got to take first. And I think, yeah, following what you're excited about and, and maybe, yeah, even things that you might not think like, oh, how's that going to make a difference? Like, uh, woodworking, but it's all kind of working towards the same thing, even though it, you might be like, oh, I guess growing food's the thing I should do, but it's all kind of, you're all moving towards something different and it's mm-hmm. all, and it's okay to be a hypocrite as well, because we live in a society that doesn't make this easy and we do live within the restrictions of our lives and the situations we're in, um, I think we're we're all hypocrites. Like we feel it as well, you know, trying to, uh, I guess, share inspiring stories to make change. But you know, we're, you know, we have to buy new camera gear sometimes. Um, that's made from who knows where. Um, <laughs> and it's just there's all these things. There's kind of, yeah, no one's no one's going to be a hundred percent perfect and Mm. green and that's probably never going to be achievable in our lifetimes who knows but you can only do the best that you can i i think that we have to we have to embrace that we're we're hypocrites i mean if you live in this society if you love people you love other species and you want the world to be a better place you're a you're gonna be a hypocrite as long as you live if you want to change the society and be a part of the society you're going to be a hypocrite. So it's about embracing your hypocrisy, um, not being delusional about it, you know, understanding your hypocrisy, embracing it and being transparent about it. Uh, It's powerful to be able to admit the things that you're doing that aren't in alignment with your beliefs and be transparent about that. So I think that that's one of the really powerful things people can do is embrace their their hypocrisy and be transparent with their hypocrisy. And it means that your hypocrisy is not a bad thing in this sense because it means you're striving for something. It's better to strive for something and be a hypocrite than to think, oh, I'm I'm not even going to bother. So, Mm. (laughs) um, That's beautiful. Yeah, I think I stole that from somebody, but I butchered the (laughs) quote. (laughs) I loved it. You did great. (laughs) I I love it. I think also it's it's thinking outside of the square and... um, thinking outside of the box and and um being creative about what your thing is and and really sort of being true to what what excites you and what you're passionate about because there you know the there'll be i don't know the business person or the um yeah any any sort of person who's has no interest in um woodworking or um or gardening or whatever but there is a way <clears throat> in which to live in this world and be in a, in a much more positive way and it doesn't have to be um, it doesn't necessarily have to be these kind of more what people kind of call green <laughs> yeah, the approaches. more obvious green. I remember that a um, a family member um, saw our film Living the Change and <clears throat> and said, "Yeah, it's nice. It's a shame they're all hippies." <laughs> <laughs> and it, the people in, in the film weren't all hippies, but there was this kind of general. Uh, in fact, none of them were hippies. Um, but that that sort of idea of the hippie mindset, um, and there was, and because, but because of the overall theme of the film, there was this sense of of everybody being involved in it being a hippie. And I think we really sort of need to take that away, that that idea away from um, the the picture of how we move forward because how we move forward will look like many many different things um and the the more people the more people can come on board without feeling like they have to sort of turn into a hippie in order to be part of this movement um i I feel that's really important that we Mm. sort of take that 
out out of the picture. Yeah, you don't have to kind of subscribe to being a certain kind of person and yeah. living in a certain way just because you care about the earth. Yeah. And when you really look deeper, I mean, I, I even my environmentalist friends, I see them making these uh, stereotypes. But when you really look deeper, you realize you look in a room full of people uh, and it, it, it's always a far more diverse way of thinking than than uh, than you would like to box people into. So I, I like to say that caring for the earth isn't a hippie thing, it's a human thing. And if you really look at who cares for the earth, it is a wide range of people that don't fit into this, you know, hippie narrative. Um, so I think that's just a, a really important thing is that, yeah, it's a diverse and we need teachers, we need politicians, we need lawyers, we need doctors, uh, we need activists and, you know, nonprofits and everyday people living in the woods. We need everybody to be a part of the equation to work for a more sustainable and just and equal world. And we need people to to use their skills, whatever that skill set is. People can be a part of this movement to create a better world. Mm. Mm. Totally. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Rob, for chatting with us today. We'll let yeah. you go to bed now. It's probably pretty late where you, <laughs> where you are. Um, but but thanks for sharing, yeah, so much of your wisdom. It's mm. I, I think it's yeah, it's think, super oh. valuable and and yeah. Thanks for being such an inspiration and doing these radical things to keep pushing people along and considering their own lives and and what they can do. Mm. It's always a nice. Um, yeah, a nice thought exercise, I guess, mm. for us as well. You know, mm. what can we be doing next? Because there's always something to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to be that thought exercise, and I want to say thank you. Um, I mean, your films have been been very meaningful me- to me. I had already awoken quite a bit when I first saw your films, but it's the exact films that you put out that 10 years ago, if, when I saw content like that, that made me who I am today that created that radical change. The radical change started from just these basic concepts that you're introducing through your films. And I've seen so many people who are awakening to another way uh, being possible through uh, through your films. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's just awesome to be on the on the phone with, or no, on the on the computer with you. And uh, because it's you're you're one of my favorite, you know, one of my favorite channels on the internet. You and Exploring Alternatives, I would say, are my top two favorite YouTube channels. And uh, millions of people are thinking differently because, you know, your video making and, and uh, the people in this movement that are doing the same. So keep that up and uh, yeah, keep that up because it's making a, a huge difference. Mm, thank Thanks, you. Rob. That's awesome Well, hopefully we can incorporate you in, the, in one of our films in the future. Yeah. yeah that's my dream that would be so cool <laughs> yeah, so yeah that. let's keep working towards that yeah yeah cool. okay rob thanks so much we'll see you later on thanks very much i love you both and i love everyone watching this <laughs> big love see you bye thanks so much for listening to episode two of the happen films podcast if you'd like to support the show you can do so on patreon for as little as a dollar a month And stay tuned for next week when we speak to regenerative ag coach, John O'Frew. See you then.